we're, we're at a point where we've made it. I, you know, I believe we've made it by far through the worst of, of the situation. And as we see commodity prices grow, uh, we're seeing a strong price signal to bring production back. We, uh, you know, nobody should be surprised uh, to see our, our production uh, moving back uh, to full production uh, capacity. Uh, and we are significantly cash flow positive at, at the levels that, that we're at right now. So, you know, it, it's been a challenging time. I think the company responded uh, really admirably uh, to it. And, uh, you know, we're right now continuing to be focused on our, our balance sheet and uh, operating costs and, uh, and uh, getting our debt down to where, where we want to get it to. So with that, I'll, I'll maybe open it up, Menno, to questions. Sure. Yeah. So, so you were the um, the first major Canadian producer to bring curtailment uh, curtailed production back online at Foster Creek and Christina Lake. So, can you just walk us through what uh, current activity levels look like? And I'm I'm assuming we're fully back to the full race. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of performance trends? And then the, the follow up would be related to the funding and completion of the Phase H expansions. Like at what um, WTI or WCS price does that become a part of the conversation? I'm assuming it's a five handle on WTI, but maybe you could just uh, walk us through that. Well, why don't, why don't I? I'll talk a little bit about where we are on on production levels, and and maybe the latter half of that, I'll I'll pass that on to John. John is kind of the de facto uh, controller uh, uh, of the balance sheet at at Synovus, and I think his uh, his uh, insight would be great on that. But just you know, in terms of, of production levels, um, you know, in March, uh, when we saw WCS drop as low as, as it did, you know, we dropped about 60,000 barrels a day at, uh, at, at our oil sands operation. And, you know, the way I would, would think about that is, is about 30 of that, um, we, we at, at, full, at full production, we were actually producing uh, in excess of our uh, curtailment quota that that was is set by the Alberta government, but we were able to produce about thirty thousand barrels above that by virtue of the rail uh, the the rail credits uh, that the the Alberta government had set up. So when we when we shut down our rail business because the economics weren't there, just by kind of by definition, we had to drop our production by about 30,000 barrels a day because we no longer had the rail credits. And then we made a decision to, to further take about 30,000 barrels a day offline. And uh, so at, 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 at kind of the, the bottom of the cycle, kind of in March and April, we had about 60,000 barrels a day off. Um, we are now at, at a, a position, as I said in my opening comments, where we are seeing a, a strong price signal um, to bring those barrels back on. Um, and we are, uh, and particularly in Alberta, with, with so many uh, barrels off production, uh, we have been able to source production uh, credits uh, that allow us to produce our, above our curtailment level. So people should not be terribly surprised to see uh, the majority, if not all, of those 60,000 barrels on right now. And maybe, maybe John, you can touch on, on the uh, sort of our thoughts about when we would think about age phases and maybe our more general thoughts on capital allocation. Yeah, so just with regards to the age phases, I mean, We've been very consistent on um, what we've talked about are preconditions necessary for us to consider expansion. And the two that we've articulated, I think, most consistently are the need for incremental transportation uh, out of the province. Um, it does nobody any good to um, add barrels in a market that's becoming increasingly congested. And secondly, uh, we've been clear that we, we need to right-size the balance sheet. So when we kind of move forward in terms of capital allocation, we kind of think about how we're going to apply the free cash flow that we're generating today. The first place where we are going to apply that free cash flow is to the balance sheet. Uh, we've been pretty clear that the balance sheet um, we feel would be right-sized in terms of gearing at about $5 billion of net debt Canadian. 
Um, at the end of 2019, we got down to about 6.5, and I think we had a line of sight to the 5 billion. Um, but obviously, with everything that's happened um, from March forward, with the response to COVID, um, you know that's backed up a bit, uh, and we are just as determined as ever to right-size the balance sheet as our um, primary objective. Um, and then you get into things like the dividend and, and growth capital um, as secondary considerations. The other thing that I would say is, um, you know, we don't really chase the commodity price um, when we think through our um, discretionary capital um, projects. We make sure that all of our projects um, return a cost of capital, return at a minimum $45 WTI. So we believe and we still believe you know, that's a price where the hydrocarbon market um, globally uh, stops working, and we think that's kind of a, a good long-term floor. Now, clearly, you can have um, volatility in around that number, but we still think that is kind of the precipice where the hydrocarbon market doesn't work. So when we think about the H phases, um, those two projects, both the Christine and Foster, both generate cost of capital returns plus at $45, but the reality is uh, the incremental free cash flow for the foreseeable future will be directed towards the balance sheet. And then at some point, we also need to have a, a discussion about re, uh, reinstituting our, our dividends. So uh, all those things come into the mix in the future, but clearly the, the uh, concern today is the balance sheet. Perfect. Just to move over to uh, to downstream, how difficult is it to take advantage of arbitrage opportunities between upstream and downstream when Phillips 66 is the operator of both the Border and Wood River refineries and has no vested interest in your upstream assets? And, and maybe you could provide some examples of opportunities that you have been able to take advantage of through this uh, downturn. Uh, Menno, John sits on the, the management committee of, of our joint venture. So, John, maybe, maybe you can uh, take a shot at that, then I may add some color. Sure. Um, you know, what I would say is the way that partnership was put together is the partnership does operate as um, two merchant refineries, uh, Borger um, and Wood River. So they're not expressly integrated into um, running our molecules. There's no molecular integration between the two. But that being said, um, what you have to remember is that Wood River has the capacity to consume about 220,000 barrels a day uh, of heavy oil, and it's piped right into Hardesty. So they have um, access on, on the Keystone pipeline to bring Canadian uh, barrels right into uh, Wood River, and that's um, you know a key and important part of the diet. So though, although we're not you know molecularly integrated, they're not necessarily running our molecules. We get the economics of refining uh, Canadian heavy oil um, in substantial quantities um, in Wood River. Now the partnership is put together where PSX runs it. They choose the crude slate. They place the molecules. Um, we have a uh, management committee um, that oversees that and makes sure that they're operating within the rules that we all established at the beginning. So we're not misaligned, um, and we do take advantage of the core parts of um, um, you know the Canadian heavy oil market, um, which is you know. Um, very um, integrated into you know the Canadian oil markets, and may, maybe one example I would give you is is the core project that we put together when we um, entered into this partnership with Wood River. We put a, a great big coking complex on the back end of that refinery that really allowed it uh, to consume all of that Canadian heavy um, going forward. So we think that PSX are very good operators. Uh, we're very aligned uh, to the way they operate those two refineries. Wood River is much more integrated into the Western Canadian hydrocarbon economics than Borger, uh, but we're looking at um, increasing the opportunity for uh, refineries like Borger to run uh, more Western Canadian heavies, and PSX uh, is open to those opportunities. So it's a, it's a mutually beneficial um, partnership, um, and we think they're a first-class operator. 
Okay, and, and ju just to take that a step further, how are you thinking about the current level of integration between upstream and downstream? I'm assuming that downstream M&A is a non-starter given your focus on balance sheet deleveraging, but is increased integration a longer term aspirational goal or do you prefer to retain some upstream operational leverage? You know, Menno, I, it, it's, it's interesting. When I, when I got to the company, uh, John and I kind of led a, a really significant piece of, of strategy work on you know, integration and, and, you know, how we could most at, uh, uh, best add value uh, to, to the company. And, you know, I think how I would describe it is, you know, I, I, I think the fully integrated uh, strategy is a very good strategy. I've, I've never been critical of it and see a lot of benefits to it, especially, you know, for an Alberta heavy oil producer. That, that being said, you know, I think the what we found when we took a really hard look at it, and I think it generally still would apply today, is that you know th that there definitely would be benefits of further integration. Uh, when we looked at it, and still today, I think that we're not seeing any significant bargains out there uh, in terms of 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 M and A uh, opportunities. It it looked then and still looks now like it might be fairly pricey and as a result it, where we ended up looking at it was not opposed to integration and, and would be supportive at the right price but in the absence of a right price I think our focus was really that we could do the most uh, value protection or enhancement for Synovus by, um, by looking at, at ways that we could get our oil to global markets where we could achieve a, 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 a you know a global price for our heavy, and you know so that that is things like that you saw us uh, when we implemented the rail program, you know the work that we did over the last year and a half or so on the DRU, um, continuing uh, to focus on our pipeline position and get getting more pipeline access. Those are the things we're doing in, in the absence of, of uh, immediate integration uh, opportunities. Okay, and, and just because it's topical, I'm going to ask the, the Dakota access question. Um, I know it just happened yesterday, so uh, it's, <laughs> it's a bit fresh, but uh, well, what could it mean for uh, base and egress here in Canada and your crude by rail business more specifically, which is you know, which is, you know, effectively been, been back burning for the time being. Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, I personally, and maybe it's because of my background, I mean, I, I, I found that decision a, a, a pretty disturbing uh, a decision. You, you, you literally have a pipeline project that's been in service for, you know, the, the, the better part of, uh, of three or four years transporting 570,000 barrels of oil uh, a day. Um, you know, I I, I was re I was surprised by that decision. I, I think, you know, I, I just my general observation of it is that um, going forward, if if that would be the new standard, uh, I think it's going to be incredibly difficult uh, for anybody to invest in any kind of of infrastructure and not just not just pipeline infrastructure, high voltage power lines, uh, highways, you name it. If uh, if if there's an opportunity to 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 come back on that those uh, regulatory decisions years after the fact, I I think that's a, a real significant problem. You know, I I I suspect that will be you know that that injunction will be. Uh, first of all, I imagine they'll attempt to stay it, but I, I expect that will get elevated uh, to the Federal Court of Appeal and, and potentially to the Supreme Court in fairly short order. I think in, in the interim, um, I would guess it, uh, you know, it's, Bakken producers are going to be, ha are going to have to be looking at rail options, and I, I would suspect it will probably, uh, for the time being, put some fairly significant downward pressure on light um, pricing uh, as, as a result of that. But I, I expect both the, the, the owner 
and the federal government will be very motivated to uh, to try to appeal this very quickly. Okay, and the, then I'm just going to ask a, a quick question on your first shipment of Western Canadian crude to Irving on the East Coast by routing it through the uh, the Panama Canal. Is, is that should we just look at that as sort of a one-off test in terms of whether it can be done? Is it is it scalable? Can you can you talk to the the economics of that? Yeah, I mean, at, at the time we we did that deal, I mean, I I think the you know it was kind of an interesting time in in the oil markets, as, as you know, Mano, and I think it represented uh, good value both for us and and for Irving Oil, um, and it was a better option than than a number of the uh, of the options both of us had, and I and and the other thing I would say is I I think both companies really uh, wanted to do it from a perspective that we both feel very, very strongly um, that, it, that it's, it's, a, it, it's a real tragedy that uh, you have Eastern Canadian refineries you know, consuming six or 700,000 barrels a day of oil, uh, almost all of which, or the large majority of which, is being imported. Uh, and that part of this was just, uh, it was a bit of an experiment. Um, the economics worked. Uh, you know, I'd love to see more Canadian oil getting to Canadian refineries, and I, you know, I wouldn't put words in Irving's mouth, but I, I think there was, from their perspective, I think there was a bit of a patriotic element uh, from from their perspective, also. And you know, we'll we'll keep looking at at at, at the opportunities, and you know, it, uh, but it, but it, it 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 was something that we both uh, wanted to see if it was it just kind of test it out and see how it worked and I think so far it's uh, it's worked out okay perfect so our 20 minutes is up and it's unfortunate because it feels like we just got started but uh, Alex and John uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference